Um, welcome back from the break. Um, for um, the second part of our morning session, we're going to start with Dan Morgan, who is the Director of Universal Access at Elsevier, and his talk is Open Access to Manuscripts and Big Data, Progress and the Elsevier Perspective in 2013. Dan. Thank you very much. Now, I'm only speaking through this mic. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll just... Okay, well thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and the chance to speak at this great event. I really want to congratulate everyone involved for the speed and efficiency which with this event was put together. I mean, it was only a month out I received my first email about this, so specifically uh, Bob, uh, Sarah, Tom, and Christina. Before I properly begin, I also wanted to say that many of the topics I'm going to cover here today are featured on our, on our blog, which is called Elsevier Connect. I do encourage any of you interested in a further reading of what I present today to check out this blog in general. Um, but of course, I'll um, feature any specific articles that I cite as I go along as well. OK, so why am I here uh, representing Elsevier, which is not exactly perceived as an open access publisher? <laughs> well, I'll jump right into the specifics about what we're doing about open access and begin with our top line principles. Um, our vision has always been to enable the broadest possible sustainable access to quality research content. And by that, no matter what position we have taken in the past, uh, we are open to any business model that um, helps us achieve this vision. Today's reality, um, the publishing landscape and archive at this very moment, is that the current information infrastructure is made up of a diverse mix of funding models. Um, we've already heard a lot about this already. And uh, this means that current benefits and costs are spread across the stakeholders involved in a specific way right now. Uh, naturally, we acknowledge that tra transitions are occurring, led by policy, behavior, and technology, um, that are going to change how this current information infrastructure looks. Um, and that is why we're, of course, here today. Um, so beginning with open access to manuscripts, um, as of this week in 2013, um, we, Elsevier, publish over 40 wholly open access journals across most scientific disciplines that we cover, from stem cell reports to uh, results in physics, fire safety, the Lancet Global Health, etc. Um, this includes also new types of journals, such as the data, data reports journal Genomics Data, which I'll describe in a bit more detail later. Um, in addition to new journals, uh, we're investigating fully any journals that we can flip from a subscription to an open access model. Um, also, over 1,600, uh, which is the majority of our subscription titles, are now fully hybrid titles and publish open access articles in addition to subscription articles. This, of course, allows um, anybody as authors to publish in the journals that they're very familiar with publishing already. Um, and I'm surprised this topic hasn't come up already. Um, oh. <laughs> we do not double dip. Um, all subscription fees are limited to subscription content only. Um, we do account for every single open access journal and article that we do publish um, in all, all of our subscription and science direct price setting. So I think there's already been plenty of summary about the open access policy landscape and background to all of this, so I'll just reaffirm, um, as you'd suspect, that we welcome the OSTP memo, but for three main reasons. One, because it leaves open um, the option for gold open access, which we believe and state is a demonstrably sustainable um, open access model. It, as you've already heard, seeks to leverage publishing industry investments rather than duplicate efforts, and obviously Chorus is an example of that, and it specifically encourages the collaborative approach. Um, we, like, we, just like you, are not just preparing for some of the changes that have gathered pace this year um, due to all these policies, but hopefully trying to help shape the course of open access, not just as some short-term tactic, but a long-lasting future. It's not just happening in the US, um, as we've heard, um, but around the rest of the world, too. Um, some of our developments are in response to these new policies, um, to these new policies, um, but some are just extensions of our principles that we've held for some time. Um, but a feature, and again, that's why we're here, is that a range of questions and topics remain to be answered and covered and addressed, 
and uh, everyone is keen to work with all stakeholders, funders, libraries, other publishers and universities to find workable ways forward. Um, there are two questions I mean, I'll, I'll just touch upon today. Um, just the, as we've already heard, just need kind of further clarification and coverage. Um, the first question is about the licensing of gold open access articles. Um, for all our, for all Elsevier's open access journals and open access articles and hybrid journals, um, authors will retain copyright, um, grant us publishing and distribution rights in the form of the exclusive license to publish, and they currently get a choice of three of the Creative Commons user licenses. Um, the choice is currently three, and sometimes the choice is dependent on the type of journal, but I'll just, I mean, for clarity, it's the CC BY attribution license, um, the license that adds the non-commercial and share alike elements, and the, the version that adds the non-commercial and no derivatives elements. Um, there are two reasons why we're giving authors a choice. Um, as, as will become evident, I think, um, many of our authors are signaling um, that they themselves are uncomfortable with some of the licenses, some of the more open licenses. Um, it seems, or we hear, that researchers want some influence over how their works are used for commercial purposes, for example, and are very concerned about protecting the integrity of their works, although there is a great deal of um, variability in some of these um, principles. It's not yet clear which license or licenses are completely acceptable to different discipline areas, and for this reason, we're offering people a choice at present. Although, of course, um, many of the funding bodies do specify the CC by license, and therefore, we advise and remind them that they have to take that. Um, there is a link um, between the rights granted and some of the costs of article processing charges, most likely. Um, some established journals offer OA publishing options, and ex you know, some established journals, not just in Elsevier, um, offer um, open access publishing options. And the CCBY license, as you've already heard, would eliminate, might eliminate some commercial revenue streams, such as reprint sales for articles in journals where that's relevant. Um, if revenue from secondary sources such as this decreases, the risk is that APCs might have to increase to compensate. And we know that in a cost-conscious world for research budgets, that's not necessarily the ideal situation. So we're taking a test and learn approach here. However, um, I really just want to talk to, for just to spend a little bit of time to talk in general terms to the non-commercial element of the Creative Commons license. Commercial reuse is a persistent discussion point um, in these user licenses. Um, for example, I've recently um, been sitting down with some representatives from CDL and the uh, University Committee on Library and Scholarly Communications to discuss the proposed UC, open access policy. And one of the things I learned from that um, discussion was um, the pushback from some faculty about concerns about what um, the repository will and will not be able to do um, with papers. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I'm agnostic on this point, but I was very interested to read um, what the STM Association is proposing, is that, that they're, they're proposing that commercial and non-commercial should not be a dichotomous either-or decision, and that these licenses should generally just spell out what is an acceptable commercial reuse, um, which perhaps might be you know, I think most people agree that text and data mining and analytics sales on top of data is probably an okay commercial reuse, but, you know, a commercial reuse that some people might have more of a problem with is just a wholesale, you know, reprint sale by someone else other than who you would like to be doing that. So it's food for thought anyway, that um, perhaps one of the answers is to alleviate fears for the commercial reuse is not just to slap on a non-commercial license, but to just differentiate between what are the commercial and non-commercial uses that people are happy with. Um, moving back to our APCs. Um, right now, our APCs for open access, and that's both for open access journals and open access articles in our hybrid journals, range from around $500 to $5,000. Um, well, those, those are the outliers. The most common range is between $1,200 and $2,500, based on the usual factors, including the type of journal and the funding situation um, in specific fields. Um, this is typically around the norm for current APCs. Um, 
once again touched on already, so I'll just give some of our thinking about it. Um, a second issue to resolve, as well as licenses, is of course embargoes that are used for green open access. Um, as regards self-archiving or posting in repositories, then our commitment from 2004, which nicely gets us the status of being a Romeo Green publisher, is that authors are completely free to archive the accepted manuscript um, either on their website or their institution's repository immediately. Um, this is, as I said, what makes us the Romeo Green. This is the Sherpa Romeo site, um, which anybody can look up the various posting policies of publishers. However, if and only if a mandate is in place, do we seek a letter of common understanding um, with the setter of the mandate and alignment with our embargo periods. Currently, Elsevier's embargo periods are journal specific, not kind of done you know, from top line subject areas, and range from six months to 48 months, but once again, those are outliers um, generally between 12 and 24. Um, certain custom agreements, of course, are in place, such as we have with the NIH. But why, of course, um, do we have embargo periods at all? Um, well, as we've already heard, in green open access, no APC is paid, and the costs of, associated with publishing the journal are entirely paid and managed through subscriptions. I won't go into this discussion again, but I'll just put it simply. We feel that we need some time before the content is freely available in order to be able to sell subscriptions to fund these costs. But perhaps I'll add that we understand that no publisher or journal has a right to survive. But the journals we publish are important to many editors, authors, readers, and the scientific communities who, we presume, want to ensure that these journals remain viable. We, and by we I mean publishers both large and small, profit and non-profit, that have subscription journals in our stables need to sustainably and viably transition to work under these new open access business models. And therefore, we believe that in cases where whole swathes of a journal will be available for free under certain posting policies, a slight period of delay might balance uh, the public interest and the scientific society's interest in having the sound research just sustainably communicated. Obviously, there is no impact on wholly open access journals or wholly open access publishers in this scenario, which is again exactly why we believe that gold open access is the most sustainable open access model for the future. Okay, that's kind of really what I wanted to talk to about manuscripts. Um, I, there's obviously plenty of things I could talk about, but I think a lot of these things have been covered in the talks prior to my talk, and of course we'll get down and dirty in the panel discussion later. But apart from open access to manuscripts, there's a whole lot more going on, and I just wanted to build a small bridge to what we're going to be mainly tackling this afternoon, um, which is about access to big and small data and our thinking and proposed solutions for dealing with them and the principles that we believe that should drive greater access and utilization of these and some of the things that I believe they'll enable and improve. There are two great Elsevier Connect stories on these topics right now, one by David Marks of our Research Data Services Group and Mike Taylor, the other Mike Taylor of Elsevier Labs. Um, but I think the case for making experimental data available is, and I've been listening into discussions at various tables already, dare I say it, obvious. Um, it opens up verifications of findings, much better reproducibility, which I think should guide, you know, when we try and decide what data needs to be made available. It enables quicker science and more rapid extension and forking into other areas. It lowers the barriers to meta-analysis and enables analysis on a web scale. And also, if data has been collected during research paid for by grants, it may, of course, be seen as an entirely public asset. So, we recommend, Elsevier recommends, and an increasing amount of our journals require that authors share or deposit data in discipline-specific repositories. Some cases, of course, data is extracted um, from the article by curators, while in other cases, authors need to upload their own data manually. We um, have been and we continue to collaborate with a number of open repositories and have set up bidirectional links between data repositories and our online articles on ScienceDirect. Of course, these links can be 
made via tagging identifiers or accession numbers, um, data DOIs, which automatically convert to links to where you've archived your data, and of course displaying banner links to the repositories next to relevant articles on ScienceDirect. In fact, for some of the um, selected data repositories, we've developed some data integration and visualization applications um, that are shown next to the article on ScienceDirect, e.g. the Protein Viewer application, which calls out to the Protein Data Bank, the Pangea data visualization tool, um, which is in the Earth Sciences, which calls out to archive supplementary data, and the Genome Viewer, which calls out to the NCBI. Um, these applications obviously are building on the tagged entities um, to visualize and integrate it into the articles. Um, just in a quick example, um, the Genome Viewer functionality, um, uh, the functionality is for viewing and analyzing sequence data of genes mentioned in the articles. Um, the app scans the article, builds a list of the available sequences based on the NCBI accession numbers uh, that have been tagged, and a list appears in the drop-down menu on the right-hand side, which is where the Genome Viewer app would appear, and obviously users can select the accession numbers from the drop-down menu, and the viewer will refresh with the annotated sequence map for that selection. I'm not gonna talk about Pangea. Um, so if you just go to elsevier.com, database linking, um, you will see a whole host of databases where we've set up these bidirectional links between data repositories and the articles on ScienceDirect. We are always on the lookout for more opportunities to link to these uh, data repositories, so um, if you look at this list and see that there are clearly databases that we're missing, um, please do get in touch and let us know. But if some disciplines are already doing this very well, and I'm looking at genomics, probably looking at genomics, astronomy, and physics, and it leads to such interesting new automatic links and cool vis visualizations that are you know, presented alongside the article, why is it so hard to get off the ground in a systematic way? Overall, I mean, I think people still make relatively little research data available to others um, for myriad reasons, and I hear things like lack of credit, lack of distribution control, and fear that others will either point out things that they missed or things that they even might have done wrong. Um, I'm sure these reasons are already being dealt with, um, either by the carrot or stick mentality and will be dealt with by funding bodies and institutions. And I think uh, many of the speakers after me will probably speak to some of these uh, changes in you know, behaviors and attitudes. But another important factor, of course, is simply a lack of time and specific expertise to standardize and normalize data and to add sufficient descriptive metadata required for domain-specific repositories. Um, in development for some time, but obviously spurred on by the access to big data policy landscape, we have a new group in Elsevier called the Research Data Services Group. Um, whose remit is to explore how Elsevier can help researchers share and annotate data. We're focused on getting data into open discipline-specific repositories, um, bringing our competences in informatics, management of process and impact and analytics to overcome the time and expertise barriers of research data sharing and curation. Uh, to make it completely clear, um, we assert the following principles around data. Um, all of this data must be open and available. Elsevier, and this will be important for some of the um, panel discussion and voting later, Elsevier is not seeking and does not want copyright or ownership of any of this research data. Um, we believe, of course, the model must be derived in collaboration with research community and funding agencies, not driven by any publisher, and that includes us. And if any money is made from this, then some must go back to fund the repositories themselves, because this is all for nothing if uh, the repositories aren't sustainable or run out of funding. Um, two quick examples of how one might monetize this is, of course, selling high-end analytic services um, that query this, these repositories and are charging for specific uses like from industry or non-academia. So as I said, all these activities and principles of the Research Data Services Group are based on solving the time and expertise barriers. Our intention is purely to help funders, institutions, researchers with this enterprise. I am not sure how to deal with any fundamental disagreements with or fear of sharing. Um, I have no doubt, as I said, that people speaking after me will talk to some of these barriers. So 
to make the specific call to you. Um, research data services are running data disclosure pilots, um, aiming to work with research institutes and labs to pilot full data disclosure services, or as they like to call it, data wrangling um, from the lab to discipline repositories, um, along with appropriate credit and impact assessment. The hope is that this will help research labs by enhancing the discoverability of research data attributable to the research team, surfacing the all-important credit and impact to the university and the research team and funding bodies, and of course getting the acknowledgement by the funding bodies that this has been done. Um, hopefully this will help institutions with increased rigor of all this data management and get it all more consistent and a step towards this being a complete scenario rather than done piecemeal. And obviously it enables um, proof of compliance with funding body requirements, etc., and perhaps a stronger base uh, for funding body requests in the future. And of course, we hope this will also help the funding agencies by increasing obviously the amount of data disclosed and shared and uh, increased opportunity for some of the analytics derived science that uh, we all seek. So if you're looking um, or interested in any of these pilots, um, please email researchdata at elsevier.com uh, or contact Anita DeWard. Um, Anita may be familiar to some of you because she's worked on some of the projects such as Beyond the PDF and the Force 11 group. So she's a, you know, a prolific person in this area. Okay, I've got a nice amber light shining in front of me now, so I know it's um, getting towards wrapping up. And really, I mean, I just want to wrap up. You know, I've, here's, I've spoken about manuscripts and data, but there's all manner of things that are going on um, in the spirit of openness. Um, we've got MOOCs. Um, we've got, you know, we made um, an Argo Arwal's um, Foundations of Analog and Digital Electronic Circuits book available free for free in the first edX course. I think that was a really great experiment. It helped us learn a lot about stuff. Our NI database Scopus API lets people creatively interact with Scopus data by building mashups. Um, this is what's enabling the, the Altmetrics app to run in the sidebar of uh, the Scopus article and the abstract base um, on the abstract page, uh, pages. Um, I've just got a couple of slides here about the journal Cortex to specifically talk to not just reproducibility but publication bias. Um, a new submission item for this journal, which will probably extend into other journals, has been um, the registered report, um, where the experimental methods and proposed analyses are pre-registered and reviewed before data are collected, um, which will involve an in-principle acceptance of papers. Um, so this will allow the future results to be guaranteed to be published, but only providing um, the researchers adhere exactly to their registered protocol. Um, the data submitted with these registered reports will be made available, and there will be an app to ensure that all of the open data in all registered reports will be discoverable, will be discoverable even if the articles are not published open access. So I think this um, openness here is not just about availability, but uh, coupled with um, important notions of reproducibility and reduction of uh, biases and any temptations to cherry pick from underpowered data sets, et cetera. Um, genomics data uh, was another journal I mentioned, um, which is a, you know, a, a data reports journal, uh, which is we're partnering with a company called Illumina based down in San Diego, and it's going to be linked to Illumina's base space app, which stores data in the cloud and kind of releases it down to um, the publishing environment. Um, as you might call it, for review and extra dissemination and ensuring that all the reviewers and authors are able to exactly reproduce um, the experiments because of this availability. This has been a very text-heavy talk, so I really just want to finish with a video. Um, this will be the last thing. Where is this video? I've lost the mouse pointer. I do have it open. Is it in Chrome? Is it that Chrome thing? I think it's that. Function FA. However, research elements that are crucial for reproduction, like digital data sets and computer code, are often missing from the journal. 
The traditional article format doesn't capture the whole page, making it very difficult to reproduce blindness and limits the use of all the research papers. Collage, part of the article of the future, and the first prize winner of Elsevier's executable paper grand challenge, accelerates science by helping researchers get hundreds of people to code and name them from input to output. It's not showing the whole screen. It's just showing the top left corner. Collage allows exploration to crash the computational elements and reduce the time it takes to code and name them from input to output. We'd have a lot of journal articles with screen resolution and that would be probably... To pilot a system in a real-life environment, the journal Computers and Graphics has published an open access special issue on 3D object retrieval. Here, we dive into how these functionalities work on science full screen. This is a collage application. It lets you browse through all the code and data that belong to the article, and it shows you how to go to the chart. Clicking on the expand icon opens up the individual elements for a closer look. For example, this is a perfect I'll kind of just take it out of full screen. Which happens to be a 3D model that you can rotate for a closer look. But the executable paper is more than just looking at code and data. You can actually rerun code, change parameters, or upload data to the real internet and explore. For example, clicking on this run icon. You'll rerun the code as it has been provided by the author. In this case, the code generates a bar graph, which is shown in this data element. Returning to the code, we can now change one of the parameters and re execute to explore the effect of the sounds. The graph is now recalculated using the new parameter value. A comparison between the newly generated graph and the original one clearly demonstrates the effect of changing this parameter thus helping you to better understand and validate the methodology of this work by experimentation and reproduction. So, by allowing you to explore and interact with computational elements, you have access to a whole new dimension of scientific content. Check out the special issue via www.elsevier.com and tell us what you think. I have no idea why I only decided to play the top left corner of that, but um, hopefully the words were still the same. Um, really, that's everything I had to say, so I'm not sure about time and how much time there is for questions, but we'll, of course, be on the panel later on as well. I think we'll go ahead and take maybe two questions right now before we proceed to our other speaker. So, anyone want to ask one now? I see one. Okay. Hi, Lisa Schiff from the California Digital Library. I was just wondering if you could explain why um, embargoes are extended to deposit of publications and institutional repositories only where an open access policy is in place. Um, the thinking around that is because it will just uh, just the general fear of more systematic um, availability of articles too soon is the simplest way to put that. Now, the discussions are in play already about the difference between an institutional repository mandate and a subject-specific um, repository mandate. So maybe these will change going forward. I can't really give any true or exact answers right now, but uh, the difference between those situations is acknowledged and under discussion. One more. Julie Matan has a question in the front. Gavish, I'm a PhD student in statistics. I'm one of the winners of uh, your executable papers grant challenge hey. back then. So one concern with providing uh, data to journals is that nobody ever checks it. Uh, so what services do you provide as an added value to the papers whereby data and code that people provide uh, is known to make sense? A very good question. 
I mean, for the data, genomics data journal, I mean, the checking of the data is just an inherent part of the review process of that. Um, and obviously, in the uh, Cortex Registered Reports journal, you know, you've got a very specific example where people are going to be paying very close attention to the standards and the, you know, the adherence to the data that you said you were going to collect, you know, as opposed to the data that you did. I mean, you're right. I mean, th these standards will, this norm of paying more attention to check and ensure the standards of data is something that will only have to increase. Um, and the infrastructure that is in place will have to know how to accommodate that, whether it will be able to expect that from the traditional, I don't know what I, quite what I mean by the traditional review process, but the review process as we have right now, or will it be more of a post-publication scenario? I don't know. I think one of these things is that we will, we will find the way that works as we experiment and as we see which of the experiments that become more successful. Sorry again for an incomplete answer. Okay. Um, thanks, Dan.